Welcome. My name is Caroline Humer, and I'm a health and pharma correspondent for Reuters News. I'm also today's moderator. Joining me today are Howard Coe, the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and the Harvard Kennedy School. Michael Frazier, CEO of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Ayn Amjad, Commissioner and State Health Officer with the Bureau for Public Health at the West Virginia Department of Health and Human Services. Christina Box, Indiana State Health Commissioner. Nirav Shah, President of the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials and Director of the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. We're streaming live on the website of the forum. We're also streaming live on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And viewers can submit their questions via email to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. So more than 535,000 people in the United States have died of COVID-19. Um, lately, we've had more positive news with the vaccines. So far, 109 million doses have been distributed in the US. More than 60 million people have gotten at least one dose. Uh, more than half of those have been fully vaccinated against the disease. Um, looking ahead, prom President Biden has promised that by the end of May, there will be enough vaccine available to immunize every adult in the country, so more than 270 million people. Throughout the vaccination rollout, the state public health leaders have really been on the front lines. And so today we have with us panelists representing multiple states, and we'll have an opportunity to hear about their successes and challenges. Um, we're looking forward to their uh, perspectives on the state's responses and, and also on the federal level, uh, where since the new president has come in, we've, we've had more changes um, from them. Before we begin, uh, we're gonna start with a short news clip to, to set the stage on the current vaccination picture in the United States. And the clip is courtesy of Reuters. The recommendations issued today are just a first step. New guidance from the U.S. Centers for Disease Control Monday for those who have been fully vaccinated against COVID-19, giving them some leeway to resume more normal activity even while the coronavirus is still widely circulating. CDC Director Dr. Rochelle Walensky said individuals fully inoculated against COVID-19 can meet in small groups with other vaccinated people in private settings such as homes without wearing masks. So what does this mean? If you and a friend or you and a family member are both vaccinated, you can have dinner together. You can visit your grandparents if you have been vaccinated and they have been too. She defined fully vaccinated as those who are two weeks past their second Pfizer or Moderna shot or Johnson & Johnson's single dose vaccine. Walensky also said fully vaccinated people can visit a single household of unvaccinated people without wearing masks if those not vaccinated are considered low risk. Those fully vaccinated, however, should still wear masks when visiting unvaccinated people from multiple households, and they should continue with other precautions such as avoiding medium and large sized in-person gatherings. I think it's important to realize as we're as we're working through this that um, still over 90 percent of the population is not yet vaccinated. And that is our responsibility to make sure in the context of 60,000 new cases a day that um, we protect those who remain unvaccinated and remain vulnerable. The recommendations come as about 30 million people or 9.2 percent of the U.S. population have been fully vaccinated. Millions more have had their first shot. As vaccinations accelerate to a record 2.2 million shots per day, cases and deaths continue to decline last week. Despite the positive trends, health officials have warned that the country could see a resurgence in cases as more infectious variants of the virus have been found in nearly every state. Over 525,000 people in the U.S. have died of the virus, or one in every 621 residents. Howard. You served as Massachusetts' top public health official and also as Assistant Secretary for Health for the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services under President Obama. Tell us how the vaccine rollout looks from both a state and a federal perspective. Well, first, thank you so much, Caroline, for moderating today. And let me start by 
extending my thanks to the organizers of this forum, to ASTHO and my good friend, Mike Frazier, and to the three very dedicated state health commissioners who have joined us today. So Caroline, it's fair to say that we are at a critical inflection point in the pandemic response. And it's a time filled with great emotion. Uh, just about every conversation we're having these days usually starts with, is it your turn yet? Did you get the vaccine yet? Was it your first or second? How are you feeling? And images of relief and even jubilation are everywhere. People overcome with tears of joy when receiving their shot. People after receiving their dose posing for selfies with their vaccinators. Grandparents hugging their grandchildren for the first time in a year. So usually public health is invisible and people don't think about it very much. But right now, public health is so visible every day. It's fair to say that millions are feeling the life-saving power of disease prevention. So as you noted right now, uh, over a fifth of the population nationwide has received at least one dose, about 11% fully vaccinated, uh, daily vaccinations nationwide, which started in December, under a million doses a day have now increased to average two and a half million doses a day and more. Uh, the president's May 1st announcement about universal eligibility that you mentioned, Caroline, is possible only because Pfizer, Moderna, and J&J &J project that some 500 million doses collectively will be available by the end of that month. And so we should pause and thank all the public health professionals everywhere who have made this happen. When I was assistant secretary through the last pandemic, H1N1, I saw that it's the leadership, particularly of state and local officials on the ground and in the trenches that makes this happen. And we have to remember that this vaccination effort is the most ambitious in US history. And it came after an exhausting year for public health officials implementing so many other life-saving prevention measures like masks, social distancing, testing, tracing, and vital coordination with hospitals, schools, and businesses. So right now, the daily challenge that we are seeing and our commissioners will describe is having vaccine supply meet demand. That sounds easy, but it's not. And to make it happen every day, public health officials have to deal with challenges related to supply, staff, storage, space, social equity, and social expectations. So we are far from done despite the progress we've made we are still running a public health marathon and we can't stop with the finish line in sight. We have many challenges ahead with respect to vaccine inequities. Communities of color that have suffered the most are often the least vaccinated and that's simply unacceptable. Uh, we are all concerned about challenges of vaccine hesitancy still yet to come. Everybody is closely following the variants here in this country and around the world. And so worldwide, we should be aware that lockdowns are happening again, for example, in Italy and other places in Europe. So back in the US, this is not the time for us to be rolling back any major public health measures. Uh, we need vaccinations to continue to ramp up and it's not over till it's over. And as we look ahead, the American Rescue Plan has just been passed by Congress. It offers major resources for vaccination and public health. And we'll be hearing much more about that through this panel and beyond. So those are some opening thoughts for you, Caroline. Thanks so much, Howard. Um, Mike, could you tell us a little bit about how uh, ASTHO has helped states roll out the vaccines? Sure, thanks, Caroline. And again, thanks to our, our friends at Harvard for this forum, and of course to Howard, our, our uh, alumni member and good friend of mine and ASTA's. And thanks to our commissioners and directors who are also on the line. It's a pleasure working at ASTA where we work with every single state and territorial health official. And it's a small group of 59 people who have had a very, very long year. And we have been um, just so honored to work with everyone across the country um, and learn from commissioners and have them learn from each other. So thanks. Um, ASTA has done a lot in, in the last year uh, with states. Um, I think most recently, we're now up to two uh, all-state calls a week, um, with all states sharing best practices and information, um, sharing, you know, lessons learned and ideas for the future. 
Um, I, thinking about vaccination and the vaccine campaign, I mean, I was reflecting uh, this morning, we've only been at this, depending on when you start, for 10 to 12 weeks. And look at how far we've come. And um, you know, people's expectations were very high. And the rollout over the holidays and then and the start of the new year was bumpy as we anticipated. But we're now vaccinating over 3 million Americans a day. It's incredible. And it's just real testament to the public health workforce and what, what we've been able to do together. Um, the, the, the other things we know about this pandemic has been that it's really taught us a lot about gaps in our public health infrastructure. And over the last year, we've seen um, the real need for data modernization. We've seen the real need to enhance and expand our, our public health workforce. Um, we've seen a real need to address equity and health equity uh, in our communities. We've seen um, many threats and challenges to public health authority and many other sort of legal aspects of pandemic response. And when it comes to vaccination, there was so much attention on the development of a vaccine that I think uh, those of us who are pulling on the shirt tails of the prior administration to say, hey, we got to talk about vaccination here and administering this vaccine. And it really wasn't only until the end of the, of the calendar, calendar year last year that we had significant attention to this Herculean task, as, as Dr. Ko mentioned, this, this really historic um, vac vaccination campaign that we had real attention about what, you know, what was this gonna look like and how we're gonna make this work. So there's lots of great opportunity here in the American Rescue Plan for our public health infrastructure and capacity. I think again, um, as Howard summarized, just this real need to look at what it takes to do this, what we've learned in this process, we're gonna keep doing, you know, learning from this for years to come. So it's just been a pleasure. It's a pleasure to be with you today. Thanks so much, Mike. Uh, I'd love to hear now from Ayn about West Virginia. West Virginia has been considered a leader in the vaccine rollout, particularly um, during those first few very messy weeks. And just wanted to know a little bit more about your approach there and what's ahead. Thanks, Caroline. And thanks for having me as well. Um, are you, our rollout was um, pretty um, simple in the, in the sense that we had a lot of um, people at our table. Um, we had our governor give us clear directions of what he had um, and what was important for us. So we, we had a couple of clear goals in mind that we wanted to basically um, save lives. Um, we wanted to make our um, hospitals stabilized. And so we, with those two things in mind, you know, we set out with our vaccine rollout. Um, we also had our National Guard um, instrumental. They, um, helped us very early on in the pandemic. So with those things in mind, we set out with our vaccine rollout. Um, and th those things were our success in that. Um, we pulled the team together rather quickly. And I think with those community partnerships in mind is what we were able to do here in West Virginia, um, at least in our small rural state. And, and that's what was most um, useful for us here. Great, thanks so much. Christina, thanks for being with us today. I'm wondering if you can talk to us about um, you know, in Indiana, how have you managed, um, you know, signing people up for vaccine appointments, uh, you know, getting shots in arms has, is really the ultimate challenge we've, we've learned, right? Yeah, thank you, Carolyn, and thanks to Harvard for this very timely panel. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. You know, from the beginning of the pandemic, Indiana's priorities have been basically to prevent hospitalizations and to save lives. And like most states, we started out with our healthcare workers and our long-term care residents um, so that we could prepare, pre protect, I'm sorry, our healthcare industry, and also at the same time, make sure that we were pr uh, protecting those individuals most at risk. We also really needed to move beyond that in our planning stages though. So we um, basically put together a vaccine advisory committee uh, with a lot of specialists from all over the state to help look at not only the national data, but also Indiana specific data. And that really is what laid the groundwork uh, for the rollout of our age-based vaccine administration here as the number age was found to be the number one contributing factor really uh, to death and, and severe illness. We knew that the vaccine would be a scarce resource for quite a long period of time. 
So we began by making vaccine first available to those Hoosiers that were 80 and older and have since expanded incrementally that we are down now to 45 and older as our vaccine supplies have allowed us to do that. Our data show that Hoosiers age 50 and older comprised about 35% of our population, but they accounted for 80% of our hospitalizations and almost 98% of our deaths, our COVID deaths here in the state. In Indiana, a 40 year old is 10 times more likely to die from COVID-19 than a 20 to 29 year old. We also wanted to make sure that um, it was easy for people to access the vaccine. So we developed a centralized scheduling system um, that allowed us to actually, the website contains the latest information with regards to the vaccines um, that have been approved, the information about who is currently eligible within our state. And in Indiana, um, we have a link to that scheduling site. You can look at the map and search by your county or your zip code um, for the next available appointment and find a clinic time that's most convenient for you. And that site also shows which vaccine the clinic um, has. So some people may prefer one vaccine over another. The majority of Hoosiers are scheduling through this website, and this has given us invaluable insight really into what parts of our state do have appointments and what parts of the state do not have appointments. We also layered in additional options for those individuals that we knew might need help or have difficulty navigating the website. So we engaged our 211 system to actually and redeployed some of our call center people to actually schedule individuals um, for their vaccines. The system also allowed us to be able to reach out to individuals with comorbidities so that we could send out a special invitation to those individuals uh, to sign up um, when the time was appropriate for them to sign up. In addition, we trained our area agencies on agency, aging and also our local libraries to register people because we knew that the Wi-Fi in our libraries might be the only source of Wi-Fi available for uh, many Hoosiers across the state. So. Hoosiers are, are truly um, stepping up to the plate. We have homebound Hoosiers that can actually reach out, have their name in a portal, and those individuals can then actually um, be vaccinated in their homes through our, uh, a program between our EMS and our local health departments. We knew we couldn't do this along and we, alone, and we've been so grateful for our partners all over the state. We have actually scheduled 2.8 million appointments since December, and at the same time have 12.7% of our population fully vaccinated. Thanks so much, Christina. Um, I, I think I want to turn now to Nira uh, to hear a little bit more about how vaccination is going in Maine. Thank you. Great. Well, well thank you, Carolyn, uh, Caroline, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be able to join everyone, and I'm, a special thanks to our colleagues uh, at the Harvard's Ph. Chan School for organizing this event. Uh, we are we are delighted to be participating and. Um, Vaccination, as my colleagues have outlined, has been a challenge. It, it comes on top of what Dr. Koh noted, which has been almost a year of sprinting a marathon every single day, be it around testing, PPE distribution, contact tracing, case investigation, uh, and now, of course, the challenges around vaccinations. Uh, Mike noted as well, the, the job of states is to take vaccines and turn it into vaccinations. And that's what my colleagues and I have been doing almost nonstop since we started receiving vaccine in mid-December of last year. Uh, Maine in particular has faced and I think tackled and addressed a number of challenges that aren't just unique to our state that we see across the country. For example, the challenges of vaccinating a state with a massive geographic space. In our situation, added onto that, the challenges of vaccinating in a state that has a number of very rural pockets in addition to urban areas. And then one that I know that Dr. Amjad and I share, which is our average age. Both Maine and West Virginia are uh, among the two oldest states by average or median age in the entire country. Reaching those individuals, individuals who may not have ready access to the internet, as Dr. Box noted, or for whom transportation may be a challenge, or for whom the process of navigating a large-scale public-facing mass vaccination site may in and of itself be daunting. Those have posed unique and added challenges on top of just everything else coming at us. I think we've tackled those in, in a manner to address both velocity of vaccination as well as preserving equity of access and actual equity of vaccination. We've still got a lot more to go and there's a long road ahead of us. There are two signs or two events that I see coming at us that will be inflection points. The first is in the not too distant future, the shift 
from scarcity of vaccine to abundance of vaccine. As President Biden has noted, we expect to have more vaccine coming our way. States are already planning to ramp up our efforts so that when we have that excess or that abundance of vaccine, we're ready to again, translate that into doses. But there's another dimension that is starting to emerge across the country, which is the shift away from urgency to be vaccinated to now starting to see some small signs of hesitancy. This shift from urgency to hesitancy will be something that we're going to have to grapple with at the national level through perhaps a national campaign, but corresponding state level campaigns to instill confidence in the vaccines. Thank you. Um, thanks so much, everyone, for, for your various insights. We're going to move along now and have a chance to dig a little bit deeper. Uh, before we do that, I'm just going to remind our audience, uh, this is the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, presented jointly today with Reuters. You can send questions to the forum at hsph.harvard.edu. So we'll move now into the next part of our discussion. And what, what I think we should, we should talk a little bit about here is... Um, how to get to those who perhaps are vaccine hesitant. Uh, we've, we've heard how you know, the groups that are bearing some of the greatest burdens from COVID-19 are also the ones the least likely to be vaccinated. I thought for this, we, we might start with Ayn and Christina um, to sort of hear a little bit more about you know, how your states are, are trying to engage, uh, you know, populations who, who may not, you know, initially want to rush out and, and get the vaccine. Um, perhaps we could start with Christina. Absolutely. Thank you, Caroline. Uh, you know, when we first started looking at this last November, our uh, Minority Health Coalition actually did a survey and we found that 70% of our non-Hispanic um, African-American population said that they would either absolutely not get the vaccine or were really not sure about getting the vaccine. So we knew the vaccine hesitancy was gonna be significant as, as the rest of the nation did. We also looked very carefully about access issues and have really been very carefully planning with mobile units to be able to get to those areas of higher social vulnerability. The way Indiana has approached it, and I'm gonna use just one of our sites as an example, is for instance, in Lake County, up in Gary, Indiana, where we have um, a very high social vulnerability index, um, higher a minority population, really is to work with our boots on the ground community mem members to make sure that we have engaged individuals from our African-American population, our Latino population, our Burmese population, um, those individuals um, that uh, have been most impacted really by this COVID-19 and then um, have actually educated community leaders, whether those are elected officials or they're the local public health officials, um, maybe the clergy or, or the pastor in their church with the actual information with regards to efficacy and mo most importantly, safety, and then engage those individuals or their family members to come and actually get vaccinated at the sites along with their community. Our scheduling system allows us to actually set aside appointments for more vulnerable populations like this so that they have the first opportunity. And we have set up different vaccination uh, registration sites um, so that people can go to the library, can go to their uh, Latino community center or their church and actually sign up uh, to get the vaccine. And that's probably been our biggest emphasis besides the roll the rollout of rshot.in.gov, which is where people can go to sign up. And then making sure that as we work with our minority population throughout all of this, that those um, messages that we roll out um, from the standpoint of uh, public messaging resonates with all of Hoosiers across our state. And, and I wonder, Ayn, have you seen similar, done similar in West Virginia, or have you taken any different, um, you know, do you have any different tactics to, to get at that group? Um, Caroline, we, we've done similar um, things that Christina has mentioned. Um, we have a, a West Virginia University up in Morgantown that has a, a public interest um, communication research um, center that helped with um, focus groups um, early on in December to at least get some ideas of what kind of messaging we need to use to get at um, some people who might be vaccine hesitant or um, 
uh, nowadays I've been using the word, um, do, what do you call it? Um, deliberating about it or, or um, they're um, just indifferent toward it because vaccine hesitancy, I think um, has also kind of been um, overused. So I think people are now indifferent towards it or they're deliberating more. You see a lot of people debating about the vaccine. But um, so early on, um, this research lab has done a great job of using focus groups. And they found out early on with us, for example, that the word mass clinics didn't bode well in West Virginia. So we stopped using the word, for example, vaccine um, mass um, clinics. And we started using the word community clinics for one. So we knew in West Virginia, the word mass clinics wouldn't work well. So that focus group um, started also helping us do research and is helping us with vaccine messaging here in West Virginia. So that's one thing, and everyone knows in um, public health focus groups helps with that, with that because words do matter when you want to get trust build up. So I think that helps. Um, with our minority populations, of course, we also know, um, you know our church groups help. Um, I think a lot of states I've heard on our state health calls um, help with that. There's a lot of trust in church communities, so that's helped us as well. We've noticed in general, our elderly population as long as the vaccine has been accessible, they want it. Um, we have not seen so much of a not wanting the vaccine in our elderly population because as our epi data has shown as well, um, elderly um, residents were dying more. So with that data and that, that news stories coming out, our elderly population wanted the vaccine. So I myself um, are more concerned with our um, millennials or our younger generation not wanting the vaccine. So we are working right now on getting that kind of focus group and information right now for that kind of population. So I think right now, moving forward and going into the next summer months and fall, we are really focused on working how the long haul for vaccines in that age group is going to be working because of this deliberation this kind of indifference, especially as the COVID numbers are going down and young people tend to recover more. So we are working on that with focus groups and with WVU and other partners throughout the state to get that information. One thing you mentioned on, on this was just the, the data, right? Having data on the groups um, so that you can understand who, who is getting the shots, right? Yes. I, I just wonder if, if quickly you could say, you know, has that been difficult in West Virginia or or Indiana or, or Maine, um, do you feel, you know, have the system sort of been tough to work with in terms of getting that demographic information? And does that seem like it would be getting any better going forward? Because as we start to get into smaller and smaller groups it would that haven't been vaccinated, it would certainly help to know who they are, right? Mm -hmm. So our vaccine registration um, website has really allowed us to get a lot of our ethnic and, and racial data and we still find, despite all the efforts, that as of just a week ago, our African-American population is getting vaccinated about half as often as our um, non-Hispanic white population. So we still know we have a lot of work to do. But when we look at inequities, we're also seeing from the data, and I think this is really, really important, that um, states are starting to suffer significant inequities in the amount of vaccine that they're receiving from the federal government. Indiana's efficiency at getting vaccine into arms is really higher than the national average and we have 12.7% of our population fully vaccinated. But when we look at it, we are, we are fifth lowest in the nation for receiving number of vaccines per 100,000 people. In fact, there are actually um, states that have received more than 30,000 doses per 100,000 people um, higher than, than the state of Indiana. So I think the inequity comes in many forms and certainly is a concern when we feel like we're in this race with the, the covariance of concern out there. And Indiana has had B117 variant here since uh, very early, one of the first states. D data as far as minority data is still something we struggle to get because as I don't know how other states feel, we still have um, a lot of people not filling out data correctly, leaving that other category or that unknown category not filled up um, at data collection sites. So that is something we struggle um, to collect, uh, at least in West Virginia, which we are trying to um, overcome. We still know our minority population, although um, in totality, 
our minority population is less than 8% in West Virginia, that we are still struggling to reach the populations of our minorities in, in our state in general. But we are um, trying to overcome that. We do have several organizations trying to reach our minority populations with mobile clinics and other resources. But um, collecting minority data is still something our state struggles with, with just data collection in general, um, just the way surveys are collected um, and which we are still trying to overcome just the way things are listed out, you know, with other categories and unknown, which I think is a struggle in general. But. Okay, th thank you for that. Um, we, could, we could maybe talk now about the uh, America Rescue Plan. Um, you know, the, the President Biden signed last week. Uh, we've heard a lot of news about payments to American households, um, but I thought maybe Mike or Howard you might jump in here and, and talk a little bit about, you know, what that plan has in it for, for public health. I think, um, you know, when you, when you talk to a lot of people, they are concerned that, you know, public health has not had the funding and that should this happen again, it, it still won't. Is, is there anything in there that, that can help us? Thanks. Sure, sure, Carolyn, I can start and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Coe for sure. But, um, you know, what, what we're looking at in the in the American Rescue Plan is probably the largest investment in governmental public health in the history of our country. Um, it's a significant piece of legislation to build public health infrastructure. And it's specific to COVID. And I think we got to keep that in, in the back of our minds, obviously. Prior to the passage of the American Rescue Plan, there were some very significant and at that time historic investments in public health as well, including a $19 billion appropriation for the Epidemiology and Laboratory Capacity Building Grant that CDC has with the states, as well as uh, $4.5 billion for vaccine administration and distribution. This American Rescue Plan is even larger, and it's going to significantly enable states to respond to COVID and build the kind of capacity that, that that's needed to address public health emergencies. Our only concern with it is um, the fact that it's it's COVID specific, and you know we know there are pressing public health threats, uh, chronic disease, other infectious disease, um, other kinds of things that public health does in communities that um, that are that are pressing needs as well. So what will what's in the American Rescue Plan for public health? Uh, is very significant. For example, seven and a half billion for further vaccine distribution, um, 7.6 billion for a public health work workforce expansion, 47 billion for uh, further testing, contact tracing and surveillance enhancements, um, a billion for uh, vaccine confidence communication plans, just a, a lot of things that we know states and territories need. Um, in addition to money for mental health services and monies for um, state and local recovery efforts more broadly, um, but sustaining our uh, capacity and thinking for the long term um, is, is a challenge in public health. And so with these kinds of numbers and with all this attention on COVID, we're really hoping we can leverage that interest more broadly to build the public health system we need to respond to all kinds of health threats, both emerging, but also some of the more chronic health threats that we experience. And I, I don't know, Howard, if you agree, uh, and this is a public health revitalization, but it's something we've all been talking about. I'd love to hear what you're thinking about that too. So thanks so much, Mike, and you put this in a beautiful perspective and we desperately need those resources, but let me, let me take a bigger step back and put all this in historic perspective. We are now well into our second year of this pandemic response. Caroline has mentioned that we've had well over half a million deaths in this country, 535,000 to be exact. But we should remember that the 1918 pandemic caused 675,000 deaths in the United States. So it's stunning to think that uh, despite the tremendous improvements in medicine, hospitals and medic medical care ever since, uh, we are still now approaching the level of magnitude of death in our country that we witnessed a century ago. So how can that possibly happen? It's basically, it's because we as a society have just not made the commitment to invest in cutting edge modern day public health systems to keep us healthy. So some of the specifics that Mike has mentioned gives us a chance to get back on track. And you've heard from all of our colleagues that there are many issues still about data, about 
building a true public health system for vaccination from invention to injection, availability of PPE, the surveillance issues are huge. The testing and public health lab capacity issues have been front and center for the better part of a year. And most importantly, we, we need to coordinate the world's public health and medical care in hospitals and clinics better going forward. And then as Mike uh, mentioned so nicely, we have to remember that this is a fast acute pandemic that's been fueled by a slower pandemic of preventable chronic conditions like obesity, diabetes, heart disease, lung disease, tobacco use, which we have allowed to grow uh, for far too long in our society. So I'm hoping that with this plan now being implemented that we can have a sustained approach for investment and revitalization of uh, public health broadly going forward. Thanks so much to both of you. Um, I, I think along that same theme, we've heard a lot about the need for public education campaigns around this. I, I know I've heard a lot of reasoning that early on there weren't that many shots. Uh, a lot of states, the government was hesitant around a public education campaign. Um, Nirav, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about Maine, uh, what the plans are there around this, and, and whether or not that time, you know, that time has come more broadly to, to get the word out. Thanks. Well, I think now is the time. I, again, in, in a number of states, uh, I've heard from my counterparts that they are starting to see glimpses of hesitancy taking the form of not all the slots at a particular vaccination event being filled, for example. And so now is the time to start talking about and thinking about how we can instill confidence in the vaccines as well as the vaccination process. Uh, you know, my, my approach to these sometimes difficult conversations is to not approach it in the manner that I think a lot of us who feel passionately about public health do, which is to try to approach it like a high school debate where your goal is to just try to score as many points on the other person as possible. <laughs> Although that may seem superficially satisfying, it's never actually accomplished what we're trying to do here, which is to change minds. And treating every interaction with somebody who doesn't see the world that we, the way we do as a debate doesn't change any minds. And so the way that I'm thinking about this uh, and my colleagues are thinking about this is as more of a conversation, a conversation designed to try to instill trust. Uh, and trust, we, we sometimes think of as a binary thing, either you trust somebody or you don't. Uh, it, it's almost transactional, but really it's just a series of conversations with each one becoming deeper and perhaps more substantive. I, I also think we have to acknowledge that there is a diversity of opinion and views out there with respect to vaccines. Uh, there are some folks who are, as Dr. Amjad mentioned, just indifferent. They'll take it, they won't take it. That's a different conversation than somebody who is absolutely dead set against any type of vaccination. So the notion of having a one size fits all approach, it may be useful for setting the foundation, but that's not where the real discussion happens. The real discussion will have to happen in communities with trusted members of those communities, in doctor's offices, things of that nature. Uh, what we can do is help set the foundation and equip everyone else out there to have those one-on-one -on -one discussions because that's probably going to be a really essential part of how we get more and more folks vaccinated. When do you think that conversation might start to include children? Uh, you know, both Pfizer, well, Pfizer for one starts at age 16. So, you know, that could be a sophomore in high school, um, which I would consider to be a kid. And, uh, you know, Moderna has just started their trials. J&J's trials are expected to be started soon. Uh, you know, it, I, I could see that a lot of parents might be hesitant about this and wondering how much of a roadway we need for that. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how that would look in Maine would love to hear as well from you know Dr. Amjad and 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 Christina Box. Thanks. Well, you know, I'll, I'll just note when we when we think about vaccinating those under 16 and over or under, I'm sorry. Um, you know, we, we have to recognize that the concerns uh, and, and hesitancy that adults may feel with when it comes to vaccinating themselves are likely to be magnified when it comes to vaccinating their kids. And we just, we need to acknowledge that. Again, we can't just swap those away or assume that the reason that someone doesn't want to vaccinate their kids is because of a knowledge deficit. A lot of folks out there, we go into these conversations sometimes 
assuming that individuals who are skeptical about vaccines are uninformed, when in fact they are informed, just not with the information that we consider to be truthful and accurate. So the, the trick is having that conversation in a manner that respects that they have a different view of the world and tries to understand what that is, have a conversation, find shared goals, and then move forward. With respect to kids, now is the time to start laying that groundwork. Now, it may be many months before any vaccine is authorized in children or those under 16. But again, given that higher level of concern that any parent would have, for what might go into their kid's body, now is the time to start talking about vaccines. This for the risks of COVID, even though they may be lower, they can still affect kids. There have been rare instances. Talking to pediatricians about getting their patients primed for the notion that later in the summer, in the fall, getting the, their, their kids' vaccines vaccinated may be something to consider. Now is the time to start doing that rather than later on in the process. Okay. Um, did, did, did I or Christina want to add anything? Caroline, the only thing that I would add is, is what uh, Dr. Shaw said is really important, even with some of our elderly population that they were really, really excited and waiting to get the vaccine. Many of them said to us as we reached out to try to schedule them for their appointments that they wanted to talk to their primary care doctor, someone that they really trusted. So we ended up reaching out to primary care physicians all over the state and giving them the data and information and asking them to please message this directly to all of their patients. And I think as Rob says, it's really Really important that we reach the American Academy of Pediatrics, our Indiana branch here, that we're reaching out to family physicians, that we're reaching out to nurse practitioners and other individuals and clinics that see these kids. And we're already planning to reach out to the high school level kids um, for the end of the year when we open it up, hopefully by May or beginning of the summer, so that they will have that information to take home to families. And the only thing I'll add to that, Caroline, in, in addition to what um, was said earlier, is that um, it, it does it does allow maybe possibly you know things to get a little back to some normalcy um, for children um, along with proper information um, for parents, children, and for the pediatricians to give them if we start providing accurate information so that no misinformation is given out early on so people can provide that for themselves and learn it on their own timeline, which is always better information. Um, everyone wants to be back in school on a normal basis, get back to their sports, travel, have that sense of normal life. I think um, parents want that for their children. Um, most kids do their normal vaccine scheduling. They're well informed about that. And I think with that proper information, you know, parents do want their kids to be safe and I think if we start that now, then I think we will have a better success rate. Okay, Th thanks to all of you for that. Uh, we're gonna turn now to viewer questions. And um, I think I'll start with this one uh, from, from Courtney. Is the goal of directing all states to open up vaccinations to all adults by May 1st an aggressive enough goal? Uh, would anyone like to take that one on? Well, I would start out by saying that I think if we receive the type of vaccine and the amount of vaccine that they're talking about, I think it's a, it's a reasonable goal that by May we would be able to do that. We really believe that by um, April into March, we'll be in phase two here in Indiana. And that's, you know, really our industry, businesses, critical infrastructure individuals. Um, so hopefully by May, if we truly receive that much vaccine, yes, we can open that up and, and allow uh, Hoosiers to decide uh, if they're ready to be vaccinated. Same for West Virginia. I think we have the amount of vaccines. I think that's, that's an excellent goal. And I, I think that's, that would be fine. And in Maine? We, we have been anticipating, uh, eagerly anticipating and awaiting an increase in the volume of vaccines that are coming into the states. So in preparation for that, we've been working with healthcare facilities and vaccine sites across the state to make sure that they're expanding the number of vaccinators, the hours per day, the days per week, uh, et cetera. So when the vaccine comes, we'll be ready. So here's another uh, one about the vaccines again. Um, with three vaccines now approved in the U.S., so will you allow, do you allow or will you allow people in your state to choose which shot they prefer? Um, you know, how, how do you figure out which vaccine is distributed where? Um, 
I'm not sure which one of you wants to start there. Maybe, maybe, maybe Christina again, do you, do you let them choose in, in Indiana? So um, by the fact that we have the scheduling website, they can look and see which vaccine those sites have. I will tell you that some of our fights, uh, sites find it very difficult to have more than one vaccine there. I mean, the J&J &J is easy. Um, the Pfizer vaccine has the ultra low freezing, has to be reconstituted. You know, there are two doses versus one. So many sites prefer to have only one particular um, vaccine at their site. So our scheduling platform does allow that. And certainly if individuals want that, we've been incredibly pleased to see um, the number of people that really want to have the J&J, &J, one dose and be done. We, we found the same and our, our approach to allocating vaccines is based on a lot of the characteristics and capacities of the sites. Uh, so for folks who are literally going door to door, the J&J &J vaccine is ideally suited. For large scale community facing sites that have an ultra cold storage, the Pfizer vaccine is ideal, and the Moderna vaccine helps us fill in many of those gaps in between. Uh, we, we, I mean, of course, on some level, everyone has a, a choice, and we ask sites to, for example, post which vaccine they are, are, are giving out that particular day or administering. And we also publish every week a list of every single location in Maine and how much vaccine they are getting and the type of vaccine. So folks can see, aha, this particular institution received Moderna vaccine, and if they have a preference, now we've emphasized the best, well, if they have a preference, that is a mechanism for them to exercise. But I've also tried, we've also tried to say here in Maine that the best vaccine for you is the one that is closest to your arm. Uh, I'll say my, my West Virginia is the same. I mean, all the sites have um, whatever vaccine is available. And we've also echoed the same that all vaccines have been FDA approved. All vaccines save lives and limit hospitalizations. But at the same time, every person has the right to choose which one they prefer, if that is the case. But we have also reiterated that all of the vaccines have done the two things that we wanted the most, which is to reduce hospitalizations and deaths. But absolutely, you can choose if that is your will. So that's, that's West Virginia. Uh, here's a, another one sort of along the same lines, but we've, it, you know, are there systems or standardized procedures in your state for how to handle leftover vaccine doses that are about to go bad. We've seen a lot of stories on this, so I guess that's mm -hmm. why we got this question. Um, I've heard about Facebook groups and apps coming online for this purpose, and I'm wondering whether there's anything more systematic happening at the state level. So most sites do have waiting lists, obviously, but of course um, those waiting lists have, um, people do get called, but we do have stories where uh, they do not answer their phone. So as long as someone can get called and the shots can go into someone's arms before they're wasted. So we had stories of course, where um, someone didn't get called or we might get a story where someone's friends get called or so forth. But we have always told a site to use the, the vaccine as quickly as possible before it gets wasted. But the process is in place is that you need to call someone on the waiting list immediately and make sure that person comes in. That is the process in place. But of course, we've had multiple stories where um, maybe someone's family or friend gets called in, which of course is not ideal. They, there are waiting lists and protocols in place, of course. And that's exactly the way that we've approached it as well. We have a policy that's on our website, a uh, so-called full use policy to make sure that if as the as any particular site is getting near the end of the day, they there is a there are there is potentially a few extra doses left in a vial. Uh, we've provided them an algorithm of sorts for how they can think about utilizing it. Uh, first looking to others who may be scheduled in the same age category but not having their appointment for a couple of weeks, maybe accelerating that, and then working their way through down, down the way through that. The last time uh, we, we chatted about this issue with the US CDC, what we've found as a, as a state and as a country is that there are vanishingly few doses that are not ultimately found in their way into some particular arm. Uh, and I think that's a testament to how, how preciously we view this. The only thing I'll add is that in Indiana, we have um, developed a program called a homebound Hoosiers. So individuals um, can be screened through our AAA agencies, the area agencies on aging, be put in a portal and our EMS and paramedicine around the state actually go to hospitals, um, clinics um, and lo local health departments and pick up extra doses at the end of the day and go and vaccinate the homebound Hoosiers.
Great, thanks. Uh, I want to squeeze in one more question. Um, I think this is a good one for Howard. Uh, is there a plan for correcting the misinformation campaign about the virus, vaccine, and, and overall science um, that, that we've seen out there, uh, you know, on the internet, in, in various stories? H how do we correct that going forward? That's, that seems to be what the, the question is. Well, thanks for raising that, Caroline. You know, one of the challenges of the last year plus through the beginning of this pandemic has been the challenges of communication, uh, mixed messaging, and then confusion from the public about where we are with the pandemic at any given time. So more than ever, we need coordinated communication going forward. I think a number of my colleagues have mentioned how they're doing that in their own states. I think the new administration is planning more of a national campaign in this regard. There's an effort called the COVID Collaborative that's putting out lots of public information efforts right now, especially for underserved communities and communities of color. And then Caroline, more specifically, uh, over time, there are more efforts on social media to, to challenge and actually block overt misinformation. And so all those efforts are really important. So there's no misunderstanding from the public and we can go forward as one country uh, trying to get this pandemic behind us. Thanks. Um, well, thanks so much to everybody. We, we've got time now for a quick sort of rapid wrap up. Uh, I wonder if we could just go around and, and give one key takeaway. And um, I'm, I'm looking at the gallery. So I'll start to my right with Ayn and then move to Howard for a quick takeaway, uh, followed by Christina, Mike, and Nira. Um, sure. I'll just say, um, for, for everyone, at least um, in West Virginia, and I guess across the country, you know, all lives are essential. Um, everyone's valuable to us. So if you want the vaccine, um, we're ready to give it to you when it's available. So I hope you want it and we'll, we'll be ready for you. Thanks. Howard? So thank you again, Caroline, for uh, leading us in a great discussion today. Um, I want to conclude by saying that before I moved into public health at the state and federal level, I had the honor of caring for patients for many, many years. And what I learned from them is that when a loved one dies, that's a tragedy. But when a loved one dies and you know that death could have been prevented, that tragedy haunts you forever. And right now, millions of people around the country and around the world are wrestling with that. So I'm hoping that with that as a backdrop, we can now look forward to revitalizing and sustaining public health and disease prevention going forward so that this tragedy never happens again. So I would just say that it's been an incredible partnership and collaboration from the federal to the state level and, and at the state level with all of our community partners in our counties and in our local communities. And, and that has been the amazing thing about this for me. And, and I have to agree with Howard, and that is that a year ago, I wouldn't even have put a lot of money on the fact that we would have had a vaccine, let alone three vaccines that are this efficacious and this safe. And so it is heartbreaking if as we continue to lose um, Americans around the state and individuals all over the world from this disease. And I, I really hope that everyone will look and listen closely as their um, communities educate them about this vaccine and, and decide to take it. Thank you. Mike? These are all great takeaways. And I think I'd just add by really sharing my appreciation for all the work that um, our members are doing at the state level and with our partners federally and locally, as well as so many partners in academia and other organizations that are supporting this response. This has been a long year. Um, and then as an advocate for public health, I, I really, uh, there was a hearing that, that uh, was held a couple of weeks ago, which Tom Cole from Oklahoma said, um, sometimes you got to spend billions to save trillions. And, you know, with hindsight being 2020 and all that we knew about our public health system leading up to this COVID-19 pandemic, um, we, we, we could have saved a lot of lives and certainly a lot of dollars if we had a, a, a robust public health infrastructure. And shame on us if we don't use this opportunity to really build that for the future. And I think we are. Thanks, Mike. And uh, Nirov, we have time for, for you to be the, the last takeaway. 
Well, I, uh, that, that's very thoughtful. And again, my thanks for everyone for coming together today and convening. Uh, I'll end on this note. For the past year, year and a half almost, uh, uh, the American people have seen what state public health does in action and what we can do when the chips are down and when we are called upon by our constituents to help out. This is what we do. And now, given the, the funding that's been made available, uh, we have before us the task of thinking about what the next phase of public health looks like in this country. As Mike said, this is, uh, th this is our time to build on the successes and then re-envision re what the future of public health will be. Thank you. This concludes this event. Thank you to our panel. The Q&A has been jointly presented by the forum at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health and Reuters.